Hello. Thank you for watching, listening this morning. I pray that the message you are about to hear will strengthen you in your faith. I pray it will encourage you in your walk with Jesus. If you have any questions that I could answer, please feel free to send me an email. My email is pepper at fbcmv.com. So now, enjoy the message this morning. Take your copy of God's Word and find Paul's letter to the Philippians. We've moved into chapter 2. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Yes, I am in a series of messages through the book of Philippians that I am calling Recalculating. Recalculating. How to navigate life's unexpected turns. What do you do when what you planned out didn't pan out? Because that's exactly the situation Paul is in. Paul wanted to go to Rome and preach the gospel. He wanted to stand in the streets and share with the people the good news of Jesus Christ. He wanted to gather crowds and tell them that Jesus loved them. Paul wanted to go to Rome and preach. Paul ended up going to Rome as a prisoner. Under house arrest. Chains on his ankles and chains on his wrists. A Roman soldier at the other end of that chain, 24-7. Yet it was from that house arrest, in that situation, that Paul writes Ephesians. Paul writes Colossians. Paul writes the little letter to the Philemon. And then Paul writes this letter that you and I have been in for four weeks, Philippians. Because he knows what it is to have life take an unexpected turn. And that's what we're looking at. I told you that the headline over chapter 1 was rely on a sovereign God. The headline now in which we march under in chapter 2 is react in a Christ-like way. And so for the messages that we will consider in chapter 2, keep that always uppermost in your mind that the title of this chapter 2 is we're going to react in a Christ-like way to the unexpected turn in our lives. So let me begin just simply the first four verses this morning. Philippians chapter 2 Beginning in verse 1. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose... Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interest of others. Now let's pray. Please pray for me right now. Pray for me, ask the Lord to speak through me, and then pray for yourself. Say, Lord, speak to me today. I need to hear your voice. There's something I'm trying to decide. There's some direction I need to know. There's whatever the need is in your life today. You ask God to speak to you to meet that need. So let's pray for one another. I'll pray for you as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for a time of praise and worship today. That prepares our hearts for your word Just like the soil that's being prepared for the seed to be sown into it. So you have done in every heart today. We are indeed on holy ground this morning, Father. And so open eyes, hearts, give understanding to these words today, Father. Speak to every person in their situation, wherever they are in their journey with you. Meet them there today, Father, and do your work in their lives. Speak through me, Lord, and to us today. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. 
I remember reading several years ago a newspaper article out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. A pizza delivery man called the police. He had seen a man dragging a dog behind his pickup. The delivery man had motioned to the driver to stop and when he got the driver stopped he went over to the driver of the pickup and asked him are you aware that there is a dog tied to your bumper? And the man said absolutely yes that dog needs exercise. And then he slammed on the gas pedal, spun his tires and jerked the dog forward. The dog stiffened his legs trying to stop itself against the street with, with no success. And when the police arrived, caught up with the man, there was blood on the street. The pads were worn off the dog's feet. And the dog was missing a few toenails. Some of you this morning have experienced what that dog did. You've experienced an unexpected jerk in life. Because you have been drugged to a place you did not want to go. You have been drugged to a place where you never expected to be. And despite your efforts to resist, you are now bloodied and worn down. Look around the room this morning at the people that are here in this sanctuary. We don't all look alike. We don't all act alike. We don't all dress alike. We have different tastes in music. We have different tastes in food. Our heights vary. Our weights vary. But there is one thing we all have in common. We all know what it means to hurt. To experience the disappointment, the disillusionment of unfulfilled plans and dreams. We all have experienced the confusion of ending up in a place we thought we'd never be. Life takes unplanned turns. You were not expecting what you are now experiencing. You got jerked around. Chapter 2 in Philippians is going to ask you to do something hard. Really, really hard. As I told you a moment ago, the headline over chapter 2 is react in a Christ-like way. But what does that mean and what does that look like? Well, here's, here's my life point. Here's where I want to connect your life to this text, this passage of Scripture. And I'm telling you, it's really hard. It is, it is difficult. In the unexpected jerks of life, focus on something other than yourself. I told you it's going to be hard. In the unexpected, unplanned events in your life, focus on something other than yourself. When you look at this second chapter, it's, it's about having an outward focus, not an inward focus. The second chapter is about focusing on other people. And that's hard to do when you're not where you want to be and things haven't panned out like you planned out my circumstances are not what I would have chosen pastor and you want me to focus on others what about me and my needs and and and, and my wants look at this chapter with me it's all about can I say it again it's all about looking outward at other people in the first 11 verses, we are pointed to Jesus as our ex supreme example of one who maintained an outward focus despite events happening to him that he would have never planned or wanted. 
Then Paul calls us in verse 15 to to be a light into a dark world. Look look at chapter 2 in verse 15. It says that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. We sang a moment ago, go light your world. Hold out your candle. That's exactly what that verse is calling you and me to be. And then Paul closes the chapter with two men who modeled an example of looking outward when their circumstances would have wanted them to focus on themselves. In verses 19 and 20, we are, we are shown the example of Timothy. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, not his own, your welfare. And then later on in verse 25, we are introduced to a man named Epaphroditus. In verse 25, Epaphroditus is called Paul's brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and messenger and minister. And then in verse 30 it says, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. An outward focus. Now, go back to the first four verses. Go back to those verses I read a moment ago and think with me about what these verses say and we're just going to let the Holy Spirit blow across our minds truth from God's Word today. In the unexpected jerks of life, focus on something other than yourself. Watch this. It's not about me. It's about my spiritual family. It's not about me. It's about my spiritual family. Do you see there in verse 1 all of the clauses that begin with if? If therefore there is any encouragement. If there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion. Well, in the Greek language, that if is what is called the fulfilled condition. And it doesn't communicate uncertainty. It's not like Paul is, is, is not sure about these things. No, it could better be translated since. Or it could be also translated because these things are true. That, that's the idea. It's kind of like a dad saying to his son, if you are my son, and if I am your father, and if you are ten years old, and if I am the head of this house, then go clean your room. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt about it. No room to doubt. So, verse 1 says, since... Or because there is encouragement in Christ. Look around the room again. And when you look around the sanctuary again, you will find that we are all in Christ. You are sitting in a room full of brothers and sisters in Christ. You are sitting in a room of people who are your spiritual family. You are in a room full of people who are knit together in Christ. Christ, from whom you draw encouragement and to whom you are to give encouragement. If, the next phrase, since, because, there is any consolation. Comfort is the word behind consolation or the idea behind it. If there is any comfort in love. And what Paul is saying is because there is comfort from the love of God and comfort in In the love of God that we give each other. And then he goes on to say, since there is fellowship of the Spirit. Since we have been given the same Holy Spirit. Since there is affection and compassion among us. Given to us by that Holy Spirit. And by the way, who who can you love on today? Who can you show affection to? To whom can you show compassion to today? Because it's the Holy Spirit who strengthens you with His affection and His compassion. And you turn around and and you give the same thing to others. That is true fellowship. And fellowship is that Greek word that you've probably heard before. Koinonia. 
It's a, it's a hard word to, to translate into the English language. It, it means soul to soul, literally. S-O-U-L to S-O-U-L. Your soul has been knitted together with somebody else's soul. Because you share the common bond of Christ. Because you share the common love of God. Because you share the common life of the Holy Spirit. You have been knitted together with other people. There is a koinonia between us. And we are to share that. And our focus is to be on our spiritual family. And that's what verse 2 is saying. We are to be of the same mind. We're to love the same things. We're to be focused on the same purpose. And you cannot do that if you think it's all about you. You cannot do that if you think it's all about your spirit about what goes on in your life. You can do that if you think about your spiritual family. Now, does that mean we have to agree on everything? No, it does not mean that. Someone has said when you get two Baptists together, you're going to have three opinions. And that's, that's, that's exactly right. But verse, verse 2 is not talking about uniformity. It's talking about unity. Uniformity is what is achieved when you put pressure on something from without. Uniformity is when you make everybody look alike, sound alike, think alike, act alike, even dress alike. That's unbiblical. It's also unhealthy. Unity comes from within. Unity is an inner desire to be on the same page with my brothers and sisters. Unity is an inner desire to seek the same purpose as my spiritual family. To work toward the same objectives for the benefit of one another. Same mind means living in harmony with one another. United in spirit. Souls that beat together. It's your life, your thoughts, your intents, your attitudes, everything about you moving together with the members of your spiritual family to build the kingdom of God where he has placed you. And there's the connection. What you thought was a detour, what you perceived as being an unexpected turn of events in my life, what you thought was one of those jerks that life takes and drags you to a place you don't want to go has now put you in a place where you can come alongside a spiritual family and build the kingdom of God where you are. God's put you in this spiritual family to help build the kingdom of God in this place. And you will miss that purpose for your life. If you think it's all about you. If you think everything must focus around you. If your focus is inward. Let me remind you. God has placed you. In this spiritual family. Alongside other believers. You are in Christ along with them. The love of God has been shared with everyone. There is a genuine fellowship here created by the Holy Spirit. And God has placed you and those believers. And you have the same mind and you have the same purpose. And God has you where you are so that your focus can be outward to carry out the work that he's called us to do. It's not about me. It's about my spiritual family. So, in the unexpected jerks of life, focus on that. It's about this spiritual family that I've been placed in to work together united in heart, mind, purpose to advance and build the kingdom of God in this place. Now I've got one more. In the unexpected jerks of life, focus on something other than yourself. It's not about me. 
It's about selfless humility. The story is told of a, of a man named Odd. All his life he was teased about that name. As a child, the other children made fun of him. Even as an adult, his friend made jokes about his name. He didn't like any of it. He didn't like it so much that he said when he died, he did not even want his name on his tombstone. He did not want people making fun of him after he was gone. So he arranged with the monument company just to have his date of birth and his date of death on his headstone. And sure enough, when he died, they buried him that way. There is a tombstone with no name. Just a date born and a date died. And to this day, people walk by that tombstone, look at it, and say, That's odd. I can hear you groaning out there. No, let me tell you what's odd. Let me tell you what's odd. What's odd is people who live out verses 3 and 4. Those two verses are simple. But just because they're simple doesn't mean they are easy. They're not easy. Because selfless humility is a virtue that's rarely seen. Do nothing from selfishness. One translation says selfish ambition. Another translation translates it rivalry. In other words, I've got to beat you. I've got to get ahead of you. I've got to come in first. I've got to promote my cause. I've got to promote my needs and my rights. I have to advance myself. I, I need to put myself out there. I need to say, hey, everyone, look at me. No, do nothing from selfishness. The next phrase is empty conceit. That's pride. Empty pride. Hollow pride. Pride, trying to maintain an image, personal vanity. Now, we are all guilty of this to some degree. Let me give you an example. I don't want my children posting pictures of me on Facebook or Instagram unless I approve them first. Now, why is that? Because I'm vain. I don't want a picture out there of me that doesn't make me look good. I want to look good. So before they know, before you post a picture of dad on Facebook or Instagram, you let, you let dad see it before you put it out there. I got asked, Poppy, are you going to grow taller? No, I'm not going to grow any taller than I am right now. But you can grow wider. <laughs> True. I, I can grow wider. We're vain. To every one of us to some extent deals with personal vanity. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than yourself. Stop vying for power and prestige. It's not about you. I told you at the beginning of this message that these verses ask us to do something hard. Really hard. It's not about you. Verse 4 says, do not merely look out for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. Look out means to fix your attention on. Look out means to focus solely on. It describes a person that only considers themselves, only considers their own rights and their own plans and their own interest. And no, 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 that's not the life you've been called to live. But when you're disappointed... When you're confused, 
when you're even hurt about the way things have turned out, it's easy to think this way and live this way. It's all got to be about me. Life took an unexpected turn. Life took you down an unplanned road. Life has jerked you around. So you've just decided to focus on yourself for a while. I got to have a little me time. And I understand the balance, certainly. I understand the balance that has to come into our lives. And that's why the word merely is in verse 4. Do not merely look out. For your own personal interest. Just be sure that the overall pattern. The arc of your life. Is an outward focus. And not an inward one. Because in that unexpected turn. And in that unplanned road. There's people who need your ministry to them. That's why you're there. On that unplanned road, there's people you're going to meet who need your ministry. God is going to place you in their path. Or God will place them in your path. And you need to be like Jesus to them. That's verse 5 through 11. We're going to get to that next week. You need to be like Jesus in their life. Because you're the only Jesus some will ever see. And you're the only words of life that some will ever read. So let them see in you the one in whom is all they'll ever need. Because you're the only Jesus some will ever see. In the unexpected jerks of life. Focus on something other than yourself. It's not about me. It's about selfless humility. Now let me give you two two take home truths. Two things to put in your pocket and carry around with you this week. First one's this. A church filled with humble servants is what this culture is looking for. A church filled with People exercising selfless humility is what Franklin County needs to see. It needs to see us being Jesus to them. And you're on that unplanned road and life has taken that unexpected turn. But there's somebody... In your path, placed there by a sovereign God. That's chapter 1. Placed there by a sovereign God who needs your ministry. Who needs to see humble servants of Jesus Christ. Second one is this. You serve God by serving others. Dusty Cooper, I'll go ministries, taught me this. Taught me this as we went to Jamaica time and time again several years ago. He taught me, you serve God by serving other people. So who who can you serve this week? Who can you bless this week? Who, Who can you be Jesus to this week? As I sat this morning, finishing this up, writing this down, praying over this, asking the Holy Spirit to to anoint all of this and use it all in somebody's life today. As I was sitting there at the kitchen table in my house this morning, early, I began to hear a song in my head that, that I hadn't heard in a long time. I I think the Spirit brought it to mind. The the song that I began to hear singing, sung in my head, is is an old song sung by Steve Green. That dates me as a contemporary Christian music listener. Steve Green sang a song called Refiner's Fire. Listen to the words. There burns a fire with sacred heat. White hot with holy flame. 
And all who dare pass through its blaze will not emerge the same. Some as gold and some as silver, some as bronze, then with great skill, all are hammered by their sufferings on the anvil of His will. The refiner's fire has now become my soul's desire. Purged and cleansed and purified, that the Lord be glorified. He is my consuming soul, refining me, making me whole. No matter what I may lose, I choose the refiner's fire. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for you. That, that, that when life takes that unexpected turn, when, when life takes me to that unplanned event, when, when things don't pan out like I wanted them to be, that I could find myself on the anvil of God's will and experience the refiner's fire that will keep my focus outward. On my spiritual family and how I'm united with them and share a common purpose, common love, common encouragement, common Holy Spirit, common task. God has placed me in a spiritual family that I would keep my focus on others so that I may minister to them. I can serve my God by serving others. That's my prayer for my life. It's my prayer for your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your holy word. And I pray it will be a refiner's fire in, the, in our hearts and in, in, in our lives. Father, I pray today. For everyone here. That you would seal in their hearts what's been said. Some of them, Father, may not have even experienced the jerk yet. And when it comes, may they remember what they heard today. Some, Some of them, Father, have been jerked and they're bloodied. And I pray that your word today... Helped them, strengthened them, gave them insight into their situation and where you are in the midst of it. And so, Father, strengthen us as your people to do the task you've given us to do in this city and in this county. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're going to stand in just a moment. I say that at the end of every sermon. You expect it. But it's important. The next moments are really the most important moments of the whole morning. Because some of you out there don't know the Jesus we've talked about today. But there's a tugging in your heart. And that's the Spirit of God drawing you to Christ and when we stand in a moment and begin to sing follow that tug and come here let me pray with you talk to you about what it means to follow Christ you may need to respond to what you've heard today by just coming to the altar and and saying God thank you for for what you taught me today or God help me or God strengthen me This is also one of the moments you can join First Baptist Church. You can come today and say, Pastor, we want to be a part of this fellowship. So as the Spirit of God leads you, you just obey. Let's stand and we're going to sing. Let's do this. I want to thank you for watching, listening to our service this morning. If you have a question about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, or if you desire to become a Christian, Would you please send me an email? I want to help you. My email address is pepper 
at fbcmv.com. Or if you would like to know more information about the ministries here at First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, let me direct you to our website. Our website is fbcmv.com. And it is there that you will find a whole host of information about the ministries we have for your children, for your students, and for you as well. So the website address again is fbcmv.com. Again, thanks for listening today and may you have a blessed week. I hope you'll tune in again and watch next Sunday.